Uh, who, for those who were here last week, maybe one of you kids, what do you remember? What were the six things that we spoke about during the passage that we talked about from last week's passage? Do you remember? Six things. Exactly. Yeah. I saw a, I saw a Jacob. It's a hand. Still finding it. Yes, that's right. Exactly right, Jacob. There were six woes. We spoke about six woes. And the, and the Hebrew word for, the, for woe is, anybody who remembers, I don't expect you to. Yeah, it, it's, it's hoy. It's oi. <laughs> you know, it's an exclamation. Get your attention. Uh, something bad's coming. It, you, you know, when, uh, when you're walking down the street and somebody who's upset says, oi. To get your attention, you know, you know something bad is going to come out of their mouth next. Um, that's what a, that's what this woe is. The six woes that Isaiah pronounced from God on the people of Israel. But surprisingly, now we're going to get Isaiah talking about a woe, and we'll get to that in just a moment. But this this passage that we're in this morning is a hugely important passage in the book of Isaiah, and as we've seen, it feeds into other parts of the Bible, like into Revelation, where we see a similar thing going on. This, uh, this passage is a, is a big change compared to where we've been in Isaiah in recent weeks. I don't know about you, but the, it's heavy going in those early chapters of Isaiah. It's pretty tough with all the judgment, with all the pronouncements, with having to deal with all the stuff that was wrong in Israel in, and particularly in Judah at that time, in, in Isaiah's day. But here we get this change of pace, and, it's a, and, it's, and it sets the tone, I suppose. It sets the scene for the rest of the book of what we should expect, of what Isaiah's doing, like why is he doing this, what he's doing? It sets us up for that. And this is the most personal that we will get with Isaiah throughout the book. You know how some, some prophets, all you get is oracles from God, and you basically know nothing about the prophet who's delivering them. And other times you get prophets who basically have to live out their prophecy. Think of, Isaiah, think of Hosea, whose life ends up being the part of the prophecy that God delivers. Or think about the guy who had to lie on his side or crawl through a hole in the wall. You know, they, there's the lived out prophecy. But here in Isaiah, we get this kind of a mix where we get the prophet integrally involved in the oracle that is announced, the vision that he sees. He has a personal role to play. And so we're going to see Isaiah talking about things that he saw, he heard, what he said, what he did. We're going to trace an interesting arc in this passage from going from woe is me to here I am, I'm ready to go. And I hope that that would be emblematic of your life and that you would go out from here having been transitioned from woe is me into, here I am, Lord, send me. Now, I've identified three main movements in this passage, and we'll work through them one after the other. The first movement, the first bit of the passage, has us beholding the glory. Behold the glory of God. And now, this passage is dated very specifically. Often, oracles, sometimes you get oracles that are just, here's what God says, but sometimes they're dated to a specific time. And this one is, it's dated to the year that King Uzziah died. And this is a common way of dating back in the day, before we had, you know, cal the Julian calendar and, and uh, you know, it's 2,024 years since Jesus was crucified, you know, that kind of accounting for things. They would count based on who's the reigning king. And I suppose that's how our calendar is counted, isn't it? After all, Jesus rose from the dead and our calendar, he's our king and our calendar accounts for that. But back in the day, in ancient times, they would, they would mark the year by how long the king had been reigning. And this is the year that King Uzziah died. So estimated about 740 BC. In that time, Uzziah gets this vision. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. He saw it. He saw this vision. We don't know if it was just kind of in his mind's eye or if somehow God spiritually transported him to his throne room, but he saw it. 
He had a personal experience of visiting a heavenly throne room in a kind of vision. I saw. And what did he see? He saw a Lord sitting on the throne. Now, let me draw your attention to this. Uh, When you're reading your Bible, you remember that the personal name for God, Yahweh, is written into English as capital L-O-R-D. And so that gives you away when you're reading your English translation, capital L-O-R-D is God's personal name. But here, Isaiah is not talking about the personal name of God. He is talking about a Lord, a master, a ruler, someone who is reigning We will get to God's personal name shortly, but here we see it's not in all caps, it's Lord, it's Adonai. This this figure is sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. But this already, if you know your Bible, this will already be starting to give you jitters because we know that people, humans, cannot see the Lord and live. And yet here is Isaiah in the throne room of God gazing on a Lord How is he going to survive this? How is he going to be able to live through this? Yet he sees a Lord, Lord, an Adonai on the throne. This Lord is enthroned. He is majestically clothed with a robe that fills the temple. And this temple seems to be the heavenly throne room because after all, the temples that they built on the earth, like the tabernacle and later Solomon's temple and then uh, you know, uh, King Herod's temple, you might call it, all these temples that the Israelites built were reflections. They were copies of the reality in heaven where the Lord was. Even though his presence, even though his glory entered into the earthly temple, it was only a copy, a shadow of the real thing. And so it's as though Isaiah gets to see the real thing. And the Lord is there, he's enthroned, and he's high and lifted up. So it's difficult probably for Isaiah to put these into words, uh, but it's, it's this, it's, his, his throne is large, maybe the figure, that it, it, maybe the figure itself is very large. Um, you know, imagine, it, you can't imagine God with a body, but, but God is so big Imagine the bigness of God trying to fit into a figure, fit into a throne. Uh, it's a high throne. It's a lifted up throne. And in fact, he's, he's wearing a robe and the robe is so big that where it touches the floor, it's as though it fills the whole, the whole room, the whole temple. This is a majestic image. And to top it off, it's as though he wears a crown of seraphs. A seraphim uh, standing above him. He is attended by angelic supernatural beings. They are the burning ones attending to the Lord on the throne. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. These are otherworldly, angelic, divine beings with strange habits of covering their eyes and their feet as they flew around. And yet they are singing. Their mouths are not covered. They are singing. They are exclaiming an excellent song in verse 3. They called to one another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. This call and response would have been overpowering, I'm sure, to hear these majestic beings, these burning ones around the throne room of God singing and calling back and forth in response, worshipping their God, proclaiming his name. And this here is the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, Yahweh Sabaoth, Lord of, um, Yahweh of hosts, Lord of earth and heaven, the creator of the world, and he is holy, 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 thrice holy. Imagine for a moment a a scene with a, a child and a parent and the, the parent says, I love you. And the child responds, well, I love you. And the parent says, well, I love you more. And then the child responds, well, I love you more. I love you times 10. And the parent says, no, no, I love you times 100. And you see the back and forth. I love you times affinity. I love you to the moon and back. You can see that they're growing. They're trying to, the superlative nature of it, trying to impress upon one another how much they love each other. And it is though that's what the seraphs are doing as they sing, as they extol time over and over again. Holy, holy, holy. They cannot 
contain it. They cannot say enough how holy God is. And, and here, it's not like, a, let's think of a maths equation, kids, get, uh, a little bit of a maths lesson here. It's not like it's holy plus holy plus holy. It's more like holy times holy times holy. It's holy to the power of holy to the power of holy. It is, it is logarithmically exploding in holiness. This is our God who is holy beyond measure. And they try and multiply their expression to magnify their meaning. But not only do they say it once, it's a call and response. It's over and over again. The whole earth is full of this glory of this thrice holy, utterly holy God. This God who is separate, who is sacred, who is divine. He's separate from us in quality. He's separate from us in purity and in perfection. He's so different from us that it's hard to encapsulate in words. And the repetition intensifies the description. And this thrice holy God, the one who sits on the throne, he calls. And the foundations shake when his voice goes forth. The thresholds shook at the voice of him who called and the house was filled with smoke. Now, if you may have been, uh, if you're familiar with Exodus, then maybe you would be catching kind of whiffs of Mount Sinai here, right? What happened at Mount Sinai? God's glory descended upon the top of the mountain in cloud and then smoke. And then from there, God thundered his word down to the people and it's though the ground shook. And it was so uh, terrifying, so awe uh, awestruck were the people, basically said, look, we can't stand to hear it. It's too much for us to hear God speak. And that is what it's like here with the glory of God in represented in this place. It's filled with smoke as though it's the presence of God and the world reverberates as he speaks. Isaiah was seeing a revelation of God's glory, but that glory was not expected to remain in the temple. As we've talked about just before, we saw it at Sinai. It goes into the world, and that's what the seraphs talk about. That's what they sing about. The, God, the whole earth is going to be full of God's glory. The expectation was that God's glory must cover the earth as the waters are covering of sea. It must pervade the land. It must be revealed. But if coming into contact with God as a man is enough to kill him, then we need God to reveal his glory in a way that does not destroy us, in a way that does not kill us, in a way that God's glory can somehow be perceived by less holy minds. And you know what? God did that. God did reveal his glory in the world in a way that could be perceived, in a way that could be touched. Remember, when they were, Israel was at the base of Sinai, they weren't even allowed to touch the mountain that God was on unless you were specifically asked to come up. Even the animals weren't supposed to touch the mountain. And yet, God reveals his glory in the world in a body, in a human who was born of a virgin, in one who was held, in one whose robes were touched and he healed, one whom John rested on as he ate the Lord's Supper with him. In John, he tells us that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. In Jesus, God's glory is revealed in a way that we can, we can perceive, in a way that will not destroy us, but in a way that will save us. He came in humility, putting aside that majesty. He should have been sitting on that throne. He should have been being praised by the angels. He should have been at the right hand of the Father. But he put aside that majesty and he came and revealed God's glory through humility. He was seen. He was touched. He was beheld. And though we cannot behold him now with our physical eyes, the day is coming when we will, when we will see him 
descend from where he now sits at the Father's side. And the whole earth will see him. All will behold him in his full glory as he comes with the host. The day is coming when we will see his glory once more and we will be perfected. We will be perfected and made perfectly holy so that we might go and join him, our thrice holy God. In our second movement in the passage, we see that Isaiah will be humbled and atoned. Be humbled and atoned. Imagine for a moment that you were getting changed in the privacy of your own home. And uh, just at that moment when you were most exposed, somebody you weren't expecting walks into the room. You feel exposed. You feel, uh, well, you're naked utterly exposed and being caught. Even though you weren't doing anything, you still feel caught. You still feel like, I'm not supposed to be here. Something's wrong. You feel exposed. And I think that's what Isaiah must have felt like when he stepped into that throne room. Exposed. I'm not supposed to be here. I'm, this, is, this is all wrong. I'm not supposed to be here. I'm caught. I'm, I'm, I'm ashamed. Even though God had brought him there, he's like, what am, I, what am I doing here? I'm not supposed to be here. And he'll tell us how he feels about this in his own words. He responds, he's seen this vision, and now he responds by speaking and saying, in verse 5, I said, woe is me. Hoy! I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord, Yahweh, of hosts. He knows that he should die for seeing God. He knows that this is all wrong. He's an unholy man in the scheme of things. Woe for me. He confesses in his recognition that his own mouth is unclean. He is unholy and has no right to be there. Now, it seems as though his lips, in some sense, in this passage, are representative of his whole being. But let's let's imagine for a moment, only his lips were unholy. The rest of him was holy, and only his lips were the unholy bit. Even then, even just having unholy lips would be enough for him not to be there. The thrice holy God should not be anywhere near anything that is unclean. Not because he's allergic, but because he destroys things that are unclean. Isaiah has seen the king, the Lord, and now he is innately aware of his own adequacy, his lack of holiness, his own uncleanness, and that, in fact, he belongs to a whole nation of unclean people. But, you know, we're in the same position as Isaiah, right? We belong to people of unclean lips, we have no right in our own person to stand before the Lord. Many of us have, have dreams, have desires for us to grow in, in holiness, or perhaps you just have a desire to grow in your humanity, to fulfill your, your potential, to be a better person, to live up to your potential. This is often our desire but we will not be able to do it. I'm sorry if this is is news to you, but you will never be able to live up to your full potential on your own. You will never be able to fulfill that full vision that you have for yourself in your own steam. Yet your desire, your goal, it will be hampered by the fact that you are not divine. You are born human. And even as we make technological advancements that enhance us and multiply our abilities, as we reach for the transhuman babble, reaching for the stars, we want to reach up to heaven and divinize ourselves as a race. But even then, we will only be augmented humans, forever tainted with the human condition. There is no way for us to free ourselves from the limitations of human existence on our own. The only way out is holiness. The only way to be free is holiness. The only way to embody the fullness of your humanity and all that you could be is through holiness. 
The only way to take on God's image is to be holy. You need that holiness. But holiness cannot abide with sin. And as we've already confessed this morning, we have sin in our lives. Sin is anything that does not align with God's pure perfection. So that can be when we have rebelled against God, when God says, don't steal, and we went and steal. That, that is when God says, uh, love your neighbor, and you didn't love your neighbor, something that you didn't do. That is when God says, love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and there is any lack in your life of love towards the Lord. We are all in this boat. It shouldn't be news to you, but it's, we need to be reminded that we are so far short We cannot love perfectly. And so, therefore, we have sinned. And because of sin, we are divided from God. God is holy. God is separate from us in this key area, being without sin. But look, we as a race, as humanity, we've been trying for millennia to try and make ourselves God. I mentioned before, Babel, you know, where they tried to build themselves up to heaven. We're going to go up there and going to knock on God's front door. But God had to bend down and come and see what's going on down there. It's so far away, I can't even see this blip that they call the Tower of Babel. God is so far beyond. There is so much more. We will not be able to elevate ourselves to Godhood. We will not be able to elevate ourselves to, the, to, to full humanity without God. We can never make it. It's always going to be outside our grasp. We need to do it God's way. And in fact, the way that we do it is by dying to ourselves and taking on God, having him fill us. Have you, have you noticed how no matter how good your life is, you, will, you always feel like there's more. You always feel like the grass is greener on the other side. And even when you've been on the other side and you saw how green the grass was, you still want to go back. <laughs> It's always, it always seems better somewhere else. Happiness is always elusive. And when we do feel, finally feel content in a moment of happiness, the happiness is gone again. It's temporary. Our limitations and our sin will mean that we'll never be able to try, find full, true fulfillment in our own efforts. And we will be like Isaiah, in dread of our unclean condition, unless God acts to make us holy. He is holy, holy, holy. We are a people of unclean lips. But thankfully, the good news is in this vision, God does act to rectify this situation. God does move. He sends one of the seraphs to rectify the problem. Here, there is unholiness in God's throne room and God is going to solve that. One of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. It's as though Isaiah is made clean by fire. Remember how fire can be used to, uh, to burn up things, to burn away like in metals you burn you you heat up the metals until the uh, filth it rises to the top and can be taken away the dross it's a cleansing by fire and so the burning holiness of god in his holiness he sends a burning holy one a seraphim a seraph sorry who takes a burning holy coal and touches it to the lips of an unclean man to atone for his guilt. And so there the offending part is cleansed. The unclean lips are made clean in this burning atonement. And this is obviously interesting because if you know anything about the temple system, mostly atonement was connected to blood and the, and the sacrifice of an animal to atone for sin, to cover the sin. Yet in this, in this picture, the symbol is of a, a, burning, a burning coal that makes, that cleanses, that makes atonement. And we could sit here and, and, uh, and ponder on this and wonder, like, how does this exactly fit with the other pictures of atonement? And I'm not going to do that this morning, but I'm just pointing out that it is, it is interesting here. We've got this Isaiah being 
made holy and consecrated. He's being set apart for a holy function to stand as a mouthpiece for God and God has cleansed his lips so that he can be a holy mouthpiece among unholy people. And the pronouncement is made. The pronouncement is made because the guilt is now dealt with. The verdict is in. Your guilt has been taken away. Your sin has been atoned for. It's done. You are now made holy. He can now stand there in the throne room because he's been made holy. And that offer remains for you. That God will make that pronouncement if you will be made holy. He will make that pronouncement for you. He can pronounce you clean, atoned for and justified. But how does he do it? He hasn't done it with coals individually, but he does it with blood, the blood of Jesus Christ. Because God needs to take away your guilt. He he can't just push it to the side and pretend like it doesn't matter. That would be unjust. That would be unfair. It needs to be dealt with. It needs to be reconciled. He need, we need a way of covering our sin, having it taken away. And the Old Testament sacrifices foreshadowed that with the, the, the killing of bulls and goats and lambs. But it leads up to the one great sacrifice when Jesus, the glory of God revealed in the world, comes to reconcile us to the holy God by atoning for our sin with his own life. He, the perfect sacrifice, went in before God. It's as though he went into the throne room of God with his own blood to pour it on the mercy seat in the once-for-all act of atonement. And then the guilt is taken away. It's done. It's gone. There is no more condemnation for those who have had the blood applied on their behalf. It's objectively removed. You're going to still feel guilty sometimes. And, and as we've talked about before, shame should drive us to turn away from uh, what we, our sin. But the great news is that whether or not you feel good before God, whether or not you feel guilty or not, if Christ has died on your behalf, it's done. It's objectively finished. And Christ will give this atonement freely. He gives it as a gift. It's grace. You can be made holy by God's mercy. And all you have to do is ask. To come up to me and say, I don't want to be unholy anymore. I am a one who is unclean. Please cleanse me. Cleanse me. In the last part of our passage, we have a commission where Isaiah will be commissioned. He will be commissioned. So Isaiah has seen this vision of the Lord. He's spoken in response. He confessed his unholiness. God has dealt with his guilt. And now Isaiah hears a commission from God. Because Isaiah didn't, uh, God didn't cleanse Isaiah. God didn't make Isaiah holy so that he could just sit around and twiddle his thumbs in the throne room. God has work for him to do. God has a mission for Isaiah. He says, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then I said, here I am, send me. Do you notice this transition from a man who is afraid to even be there? Woe is me, but now he's saying, send me. Lord, let me go and do your work for you. He's been made holy, so now he can, instead of shrinking in fear, he can stand up and say, deploy me. Wherever you want me to go, I'll be there. The Lord has a mission for him, and this is God's mission. Isaiah probably should have asked what the mission was before he accepted. But he says, God says, go and say this uh, to this people, being uh, God's people, Israel, Judah. Go and say to this people, Keep on hearing, but don't understand. Keep on seeing, but don't perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand in their hearts and turn and be healed. That's a pretty heavy going mission. Look, go and take God's word. Go and take it to them, but they're not going to listen to you. 
And in fact, the more you speak it to them, the more they're not going to want to listen. They're going to keep pushing away. They're going to, their ears are going to get um, heavier. They're going to be blinded. They're going to keep pushing it away. But if they did, if they did hear it, if they did understand, if they did see, then they would understand and they would turn and they would find healing with the Lord. So why did, why did God send Isaiah on this mission then? Well, I can tell you in part, it's so that we can stand here millennia later reading these words and be warned, right? It, it's, as, it's as though it's a lived out example of what it looks like to turn against the Lord and to suffer the judgment of God. That's one thing. But in, in some sense, it's the justifying, right? It's the, it's the, it's the pronouncement of the, of the, of the evidence for the guilty verdict. God's judgment is coming and Isaiah has to go out and say, this is why you're guilty, right? This is the, this is the evidence for why God is going to do what he's going to do to you in judgment. And this is not going to be an easy task. How long does Isaiah have to do this? How long? Until exile. He says, how long, O Lord? And he said, until cities lie waste without inhabitant and houses without people and the land is a desolate waste and the Lord removes people far away and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. So basically saying until the exile, until all the people are taken away and the the whole country is basically destroyed, until then, it's your job to continue sharing this message with the people who don't want to hear. It's God's judgment against their unholiness as we've been talking about in recent weeks it is it is it is all fair they are deserving of this but it's Isaiah's job to continue pronouncing the message even if they don't want to hear he continues and though a tenth remain in it it will be burned again like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when it is felled the holy seed is its stump so you know how when you cut down a tree before we had um before we had, what do you call them, stump removal machines that come in and grind down your stump. The way that you would get rid of a stump was that you, you'd, you'd cut down the tree and then you'd light a fire in it to burn it down again, to try and crumble it into, into nothing. And God says, look, it's, that's what's going to happen. You, your nation as a tree, it's getting cut down, but even the stump is going to be burned to nothing. But there's this tiny, tiny glimpse of hope that there is still going to be a stump And the holy seed is its stump. In other places in the Bible, they talk about it like this, that even though there is a stump, there is a a branch of Jesse. Uh, There is a root of David. There is something that survives, even though the tree has been cut right back to almost nothing. There will be a remnant God will not utterly destroy them. This thrice holy God will reveal his holiness by sending Babylon and earlier Assyria to the northern kingdom. They would send them to destroy the people and to remove them, to send them off into exile so that the place would be desolate. But God would fulfill his promises. His promises to David to always have a son of David on the throne. He would fulfill his promises to bless all the nations through Abraham's seed. He would fulfill his promise in the curse in Genesis where he said the seed of the woman will crush the serpent's head. And so this prediction, I'm happy to tell you, has been fulfilled. There is a holy seed that was the stump and that holy seed in some sense was the remnant of the nation that would come back and be uh, in Israel once again after the exile. But even more so, a greater fulfillment of this prophecy is the fact that Jesus himself was the seed, the offspring of the woman who would crush the serpent's head. Even though God brought judgment and discipline to Israel, he would not utterly destroy. Instead, he would send a saviour. He would still reveal his glory, despite the fact that they had broken their covenant with him. He was going to keep his end up of the covenant. And so we have seen, as we've worked our way through this passage, a transition from woe is me to here I am, send me, deploy me. 
We have this thrice holy God who has revealed himself, revealed his glory in Jesus. And we're going to see more of Jesus' glory when he comes again. We've been reminded that we, like Isaiah, have no right to go into the throne room lest God makes us holy, lest we be made clean. And so I implore you to find your uncleanness being cleansed in Christ, to find atonement in Christ, to be repenting and putting your faith and trust in Jesus. We have been reminded that there was a holy seed that remained, a holy seed, an offspring who came and crushed the serpent, Jesus Christ our Lord, who defeated Satan, sin and death as he went to the cross and rose from the dead. And now he sits at the right hand of God once more. And he commissions his people. What did Jesus do after he defeated Satan, sin and death? After he taught his people for 40 days, after, after he was resurrected? He took them to a mountain and he commissioned them. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of every nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them all that I have commanded you, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you to the end of the age. Christ is here with us now by his Spirit, helping us on his mission that he gave to us. We've been made clean through Christ, and now we have a mission. Now we have a commission to go into the world and to make disciples. And that's why we were at the river last week, baptizing our Lockie. And that's why uh, so many of you have been baptized. You have taken on this sign. You have become disciples of our Lord and Savior Jesus. But there's not enough of us here. This room has got plenty more space for more people to come in, to come into Christ, to be made holy. We've got more space for more disciples and we need to go and make them. Even though God is at work by his spirit, he chooses to work through his people to make disciples. It's our job to go out and make them. We make them in our homes with our kids. That's one of the primary places if you're a parent, you're doing your discipleship is you're discipling your kids into Christ. But that's not where it stops. Like the early church, we go to every tribe and tongue and nation, including those people who live next door to us, including those people who sit in us opposite us in a cubicle, including those people that we bump into at the shops. We are out in the world making disciples. But you know what? Like Isaiah, there will be many who don't want to hear it. They don't want a bar of it. It's as though you're speaking to a brick wall. But the beautiful thing is that there will be some who do hear. In the, in the opening chapters of John, it, it, I, I, I will just, uh, I'll just pull it up because it's, uh, it's very, very relevant in John 1. Jesus came, he was coming into the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, his own people did not receive him, but... Even Jesus was rejected, like Isaiah was rejected. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Brothers and sisters, as we take this message out, there will be many who don't want to hear it, but there will be some. And I don't know if you want to think about it this way, but it's important to remember to those people who we come and we bring the message and they reject it, 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 our role in their life is to pronounce this judgment like Isaiah. If you will not be found in Christ, you will stand before God unclean and he will bring his wrath and his judgment to bear on that unholiness. And so, like Isaiah, we pronounce judgment on people. We come and take out the gospel and we tell them about the judgment. We tell them about the wrath because they need to know what they need to be saved from. And they need to know what they are going to if they will not come and find a refuge in Jesus Christ. Now, one last thing as we come to a close. I wanted to show you the fact that our church services, you might notice, are shaped in the same way that this book is shaped. There's variances from week to week. But what do you notice about when we come to church? We, are, we come to church 
and we start with worshipping God, beholding our God and speaking about his glory. And then what do we do next? We recognise our sin and we confess our sin before the Lord. We ask for his forgiveness and we are reminded that in Christ we do have forgiveness. We are assured of pardon. But we don't stay there. Like Isaiah, we stand up and say, okay, Lord, what do you want us to do? And then we read God's word and we, and we sing about what God has commissioned us to do in the world. And we stand and we, we sit, sorry, and we listen to the word being proclaimed and preached and explained so that we are then ready to be commissioned to go out into the world as Christ's people. And so that's what I want you to do today, to be ready to go out into the world as Christ's people on mission for him, living for him as a holy people. If there's any unholiness in your life that hasn't been dealt with, I, I admonish you to deal with it, to go to the Lord and to get holy. If you do not know him yet, now is the time, now is the day of salvation for you. Come and find your, your cleanness, your purity, your, your atonement in Christ. But we as an atoned people have been sent out into the world. We've been commissioned. So let's stay on mission Let's do what the Lord has called us to do and we can do it with our head held high because we are the justified, sanctified people of God. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for the fact that you make us holy. We thank you, Lord, that you've revealed yourself to us as the holy God, the thrice holy God and we recognise that we need to be made right with you, that you've made that way through Jesus. Lord, now as people who have been forgiven, people who have been renewed in life. Lord, help us to go and live this life for you, to live it on, on mission, doing what you want us to do. Please, Lord, bless this and work through us for the sake of your holy name so that your word might go out, whether it be the sweet news of joy to those who will receive the gospel or the pronouncement of fair and just judgment on those who will stand against you and rebel, remain in their rebellion. Lord, please save a great multitude. <laughs> Help us, Lord, to make many more disciples. And we ask this in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen.